Our scripture this morning will be coming from Jeremiah chapter 1, and also from 1 Peter chapter 2. Before we read, let us pray. Lord, we ask your blessings upon this reading of your word, if you would bless it to our understanding and to our hearts, that we would be doers as well as hearers of it. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Jeremiah 1, starting with verse 4, and Jeremiah speaking. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am a youth, for you shall go to all to whom I send you. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. And then from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, and we drop down to verse 9. So starting with verse 1 of chapter 2, 1 Peter. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. And then down to verse 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be unto God. I saw where Governor of West Virginia, Jim Justice, wanted to move Frederick County, Virginia, to be part of West Virginia. And I personally would like that to happen. If it happened, I'd love to live in West Virginia. <laughs> Virginia's gone all the pot. I think, I think the way that uh, you know governments work, that's probably not going to happen for a long time if it ever was. But one thing that's probably the same in Virginia and in West Virginia is the division of motor vehicles. I had to go there the other day, and you know every organization has a mission statement, and the mission statement says what the goals and attitudes are of the organization. And it's for those who work there and those who come in to see what they're supposed to deal with. I don't know what the DMV's mission statement is. <laughs> but, you know, what you experience when you go there is probably very different than what the mission statement is. Because if you're, and it's anything like Virginia, you go and you stand in a big long line, no matter what day you go or what time of day, and you stand in a long line and there's one lady usually at the front desk who sees that you've got all the papers you need. And then you go sit down and get to play bingo because somebody will call out, you know, now serving B-42 at window number seven. <laughs> and you never win the bingo because even when you go up, you got to pay. You know, you never get anything. You just pay out money. But from what I've seen, it seems like the mission statement, particularly for that poor lady at the front desk, her mission statement is in reality to make you stand in that line at least twice before you get anything done. It doesn't matter what papers you have to sign, you got another one that you need. And it doesn't matter how many signatures you have, there's another signature that you need. And when you finally come back and have all that, well then there's some other organization that you need to get a paper from before you can come do anything with them. And it just seems like that's the way that it works. So we may say one thing is our mission statement. But the way that it is experienced may well be another. And it can be that way with our spiritual lives as well. And we need to take a look at our spiritual lives and, and see, make sure that what mission statement we may have matches up with our lives. Now, the church here at Idaho has a mission statement. It's printed on the front of your bulletin. And I'll let you read that at your, your leisure at home. 
But we as individual Christians, you know, also should, I'm not saying write down a mission statement, but should keep in our minds what our mission is. So first we need to ask, what is our mission as Christians? What is our purpose? For we do have one. When you read Jeremiah, as we read this morning, you see where God tells Jeremiah, I knew you before you were even born. I knew you when you were in the womb still, and even there I ordained you and, and sanctified you to be a prophet to the nations. And in another section, he tells Jeremiah the same thing. I knew you before you were born, and I have good things for you and not bad things for you. So we can see from that that God knows us even before we're born, and that he has for each of us a mission and a purpose. And so if we had a mission statement of ourselves, what we're supposed to be as Christians, it probably ought to focus on what it is God has called us to do. What is God's purpose for us? And that might beg the question for some of us to ask, well, what is it that God has called me to do? And that's really a great question, and one we ought to ask not just once, but many times in our lives. What is it that God is asking me to do? Well, some people, of course, can find their calling through the gifts and experiences they have in their lives, you know. If you're a gifted musician, part of your calling may be to, to do that for the church. Uh, if you're gifted in craftsmanship, it may be to use that somehow to God's glory. If you have a, a gift of leadership abilities, then God certainly can use those gifts. If you're hospitable, God can always use the gift of hospitality. If you're sociable to people and get along well with others, God can use that as, a, as an opportunity to witness to others. It could be that some experience that we've been through also gives us a mission. I've not had to face cancer in my own life, but some people have. And those who have know what those who are going through are going through, and that is a mission for them that they could use. I know what you're going through. You know, if you have a particular loss in your life, that others have not and others do, you can know what people are going through. So sometimes our experiences give us what our mission, our calling may be. Now some people otherwise might say, well, I'm not good at anything. I don't have any skill that God can use. So what am I supposed to do? Well, first of all, it's probably not true. You probably have more skills than you realize. But even if it were true, it doesn't mean that the Lord has no use for you. If you look around, as I've said before, and you see something that needs to be done, then it could well be that God's calling you to that. If you look around and you see that there are people that need help, if there are people that, you know, children that need teaching, or youth that need programs and mentoring, or if there are people that need to be fed or need to be clothed, um, if there are people that just need to be loved and talked to. If you've ever said, somebody ought to do that, well, that somebody may be you. God may be letting you see that to call you to that task. Now, you might answer, well, I don't have the skills. I don't have the time. I don't have the ability or the knowledge to do that. Well, do you see how the Lord answers Jeremiah? Jeremiah's answer to the Lord's call is, Lord, I'm too young. And basically what he's saying is, I'm so young, I have no experience in anything, and nobody's going to listen to me. You know, that was a society that valued elders and elders' wisdom so they weren't going to pay any attention to what a young boy had to say. Well, the Lord says, don't say that. Don't say you're too young. I called you. So you go where I tell you to go and say what I tell you to say and don't be afraid of them and I'll be with you everywhere that you go. The Lord doesn't call us to something without giving us what is needed. You know, we may well have the skills in ourselves that we didn't know we had. I know people who have said, you know, I just can't deal with children. I've never really had that connection. And then somehow they're forced into working with kids and they find out they enjoy it. The kids love them. And they find a connection that they didn't realize they had. It can be that with other skills too. You may say, I don't particularly have that skill. You may find out you do. But even if you don't have some skills, there may be people sent to join in the work with you that have the skills that are needed. Whatever it may be, the Lord will provide, just as he says that he will. And even if you look around and don't see things that need to be done, even if it doesn't seem that God has given you some dream or skill that can be used in a mission, we all still yet have no excuse. We all still have a mission from the word of the Lord itself. And we see part of it today in 2 Peter. It's based, of course, upon the supreme mission that is given to us by the Lord 
at the end of, of the Gospels where he says, go unto all the nations and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teach them all that I've commanded you. You know, that's upon all of us. That's all of our job to do, to go into all the world, which well means walking around here in Lost City and Matthias and wherever we go and spread the good news of Jesus Christ. And it's continued with what Peter has to say and what we read today. You know, we are told that we are a special people. We're a royal priesthood. We're set apart for the serving of the Lord. Now, that's a central belief of Presbyterians in particular and, and most Protestants in general is that we don't require a special priesthood to stand between us and the Lord. We are all part of the priesthood of believers. We all have different callings. We do different things, but we're all part of that special priesthood. I'm not a priest. I'm just like you. It's just my calling is to be you know, a minister, uh, to speak. Um, your calling might be a little different, but whatever the calling may be, it's all part of the priesthood of believers. And as a part of that priesthood, we are to sing the praises of God, Peter tells us, wherever we go. That means that we are to witness to what the Lord has done for us wherever we're to go. And our lives are to show the goodness of God in what we do so that we bring honor to the Lord's name so that even when people want to speak evil of us they'll have seen the good that we have done and we'll have to at least say that we did that and when the day when the Lord comes as Peter tells us they will say these people did good Peter tells us that we have tasted how good the Lord is this means we've had a taste in our lives of the goodness of God of his joy and peace and strength and love and purpose and salvation and goodness. And having tasted that, we're to tell the rest of the world about it. You know that if you've ever gone to a really good restaurant, you're going to tell other people about it, aren't you? If you go to a good restaurant, you're going to say, man, they have the best meatloaf I've ever eaten. You need to go there. Or they have the best pies I've ever seen. You're going to have to go try that. Well, if we do that with food, why don't we do that with something as important and as great and wonderful as the Lord is as well. We should. We should witness to his goodness. If we've tasted the goodness, we should tell others about it. And we should be active in doing that. You know, some folks, they think when they join the church, it's, well, Lord save me. I'm going to sit down and wait on him now. You know, <laughs> wait. It doesn't work that way. You're supposed to get up and do things for the Lord. And then there are other folks, as my dad said, that like to sit at the spout where the glory comes out, but then not do anything else. You know, they, they like to sit where all the glory pours out, but don't want to do anything. It's good to have that glory pour out upon you, but that's meant for a purpose, to fuel you up to go do the work of God. So one way or another, we are called to a mission. And we need to ask ourselves, do we actually do those missions? Where the rubber hits the road, do we actually engage in the things we're supposed to do? Unlike the BMV, does our mission statement as Christians show in what we do? You know, it's kind of an old hack saying, but it's true. And that is, if it was illegal to be a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict us? Other than our name on a roll, if people looked at our lives, would there be enough evidence to convict us of being Christians? Do we say one thing and do another? Do we say one thing and do nothing? Or do we talk the talk and walk the walk? Those are tough questions to ask, but ones we need to ask. Uh, and like I say, we need to do it every so often to make sure we're on track with the Lord. If we've tasted the Lord and his goodness, we need to share that. And in closing, I'll tell you a story. There was a professor who was giving a lecture open to the public on atheism. He was an atheist, and he was going to tell people why that was good and why faith was really just a bunch of bunk. And he was quite convincing. And in his ability to speak and in his knowledge, he was able to shut down and shoot down a lot of folks in their arguments that they had. Until finally, an old man sitting in the back raised his hand. The professor called on him. The man stood up and took a full minute to take a bite out of an apple and chew it and swallow it. And the professor waiting on him, right before the professor said somebody else, the old man said, Professor, is the apple I'm eating sweet or sour? And the professor laughed and said, how can I know I've not tasted it? And he said, well, how can you say anything about the Lord if you've not tasted him? And that's a good thought. You know, 
People can argue a lot of things, and they can deny a lot of things, but the best witness is what the Lord has done for us. You know, they can't deny what God has done for us. And they can see in our lives what the Lord has done for us, from the way we act and the way we are. Uh, UPS, that lake worked with a lady, you know, you couldn't openly talk about your faith there, corporate situation. But I knew this lady was a Christian long before I talked to her and found out she was, just by the way she acted, just by the way she was. And, and it was, she was a Christian. So it's the same way with us. You know, we should be able to witness to our own experience. And that's the most powerful witness of all. You don't have to know the Bible front and back. You don't have to be able to quote verse and chapter on everything. Just say, this is what the Lord has done for me. When they ordered Peter and, uh, I believe it was John, or James, that was John, I think. When he ordered them not to speak about Jesus anymore, what was it Peter said? How can I help but speak about what God's done for me? This is what the Lord has done for me. I bubble over with it. I can't help but to do that. And we should be the same way. We uh, need to look and see what our mission is and then ask the Lord to help us do it. For if the Lord has called us, he will provide it. And he will see it through if we but put our hand in his. So let's get on with the mission that God has called us to. Let us pray. Lord, having tasted your goodness, then we have purpose in you. And our purpose is to share that goodness with others. Help us, Lord, to find ways to do that. Open our eyes to ways to do that. Open our eyes to people that need to hear that good news. And give us the words to say and the things to do that we might witness that good news to those around us. Lord, like your people through all ages, we open our hearts and our lives and we say, Lord, here I am, use me. And Lord, so we open our lives to whatever it is you call us to. And Lord, we place our hand by faith in yours, knowing that you will lead us, guide us, and direct us in all things. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.